Hi, what a pleasure. John Ullman and I are 100 years old. <laughs> and uh, we both started a midlife crisis in the 1960s. Um, he was having to drive with his friends to Portland because there was no place to have bluegrass and blues and all those wonderful things going on. And so uh, they got tired of driving to Portland, he said. And uh, so he got to, uh, together with a, a dinner one night and they decided they'd have 20 of them and they'd all put 20 bucks in and they'd put their own concert on. And that was the start. So they, in 1966, they formed the uh, Seattle Folklore Society and on November 15th presented blues players Mississippi Fred McDowell and Mance Lipson, booking them through our Hooli. I was in an alternative universe in that Palo Alto, California. And I got to see Man Slipscomb at the same time on his first Art Hooli LP release at a little theater in Palo Alto. We are about to get involved in an open mic. The Seattle Folklore Society was a much grander scale. They were putting on a concert. So Allman, Namkung, and the Williams, they all got together. And that first concert was held at the University Friends Center in Seattle. The Seattle Times did a huge, big article on it. Admission, $1.50. <laughs> they sold it out. Great price. And they had 200 more in line after the concert was sold out. The center, fortunately, had another room. And so they moved all those people into that other room. And they did the two artists did the concert there and went over and did the other concert. So it worked out. Then they hooked up with uh, and presented the New Lost City Ramblers uh, with Mike Seaver. And Mike Seaver became one of the greatest supporters of the Seattle Folklore Society, all the way from back east, but he, he was a guru for them. Bill Monroe came to town. Did you know that Bill and Bill and Williams were members of the Bluegrass Boys? <laughs> on the way to Seattle, Bill Monroe's tour bus broke down. And uh, so he phones up and says, I think I'll fly up with my guitarist and uh, Doug Green and you fill in the rest of the band. So Phil and Vivian Williams and Paul Wiley became the Bluegrass Boys for that evening. <laughs> Reverend Gary Davis did three concerts at the Seattle Folklore War Society. In my alternate world down in Palo Alto, Reverend Gary Davis was playing at Stanford University Coffee House and I was covering with a photographer at the time to write an article. And uh, I was sitting probably the distance between one chair and another chair, where Gary Davis was a really short stage. I was looking right into a bird hole in his wonderful Gibson from his cigarette smoking. <laughs> Marvelous little show. Then, Seattle Folklore Society brought in Lightning Hopkins. In my Bay Area alternative, Lightning Hopkins and Mose Allison were playing in San Francisco. Well, Mose Allison did a song that, that um, uh, Hopkins had done for years. Hopkins jumped right up on the stage right after him, and he played that same song. And of course, the crowd went wild, and, and they all knew what was going on. And uh, Mose Allison stomped out, never played the second set, just disappeared. <laughs> so, um, but the Seattle Folklore Society story is much better. <laughs> they always taught us. They, um, the, in, this, in your universe up here, the event got raided twice in the same night. First on Mike Russo's opening set, four officers had been sent to shut the concert down. The officer spotted Bill Williams and was a friend and supporter of Bill and Bill, Vivian Williams' bluegrass band. Well, they asked the officers, yeah, why are you here? The officer says, I don't know. <laughs> Something I have to find out. And at 11 p.m. that night, the Seattle Cabaret Commissioner, I love that same title, came to shut the concert down because it's not legal under the permit to have people dance. There was no dance. And John Ullman told them to go upstairs and look, there's no dancing. The commissioner went up there and he looked, there's no dancing. Huh. But he said, but it says so in the newspaper, we're going to shut you down anyway. <laughs> then the manager of the hall, a large Scandinavian woman, put her arm around the shoulder of the balding, round cabaret commissioner and said, horrible. These are nice people. 
They're not fraternity kids throwing up all over the place. <laughs> Let them finish their thoughts. Well, okay, Matilda. <laughs> and he returned to policing Seattle nightlife. <laughs> Seattle Folklore Society brought in Joe Williams on his nine-string guitar, one of my favorite, favorite performers. Later came Jesse Fuller, the one-man band out of San Francisco. Of course, we saw all over around San Francisco at festivals and on the streets. I arrived in late 1969 and started what became Victory Music in the late 69. So our, our world, the parallel universe is starting to merge a little bit here. Seattle Folklore, Folklore Society booked Mike Russo, Sonny Terry and Browning McGee, Georgia Sea Island Singers, John Lee Hooker, and Courtsy did Victory Music did the same. The Ralph Stanley show unfortunately lost a lot of money for me. So Sonny Terry and Browning McGee did, did a benefit to get the, the whole thing back on good financial ground. And they were the first artists we booked. Sometimes we fall on our face. Like the Sunny Terry and Brown McGee sold out, we had less luck with the Georgia Sea Island singers. We did very well with John Lee Hooker, superb. The Polar side didn't have so much luck. That was the luck of the draw. You never knew what was going to work or why. Also around this time, the Seattle Folklore Society was publishing the Seattle Folklore Society Journal, SFS Journal. Again, a wonderful crosstalk between our organizations. Diane Auer, who was the editor, she and her husband, Diane Auer, came down to court scene, not just to play, but to encourage us and to try to help us, you know, get along, make contacts, and you know, move through the, through the whole montage you have to do when you get started. And they did the same thing for the Olympia Folk Society. This journal archive is a wonderful information, history, and reflection of folk music for our local base and has universal appeal. There's also videos that were done by KCTS TV and University of Washington Department of Ethnomusicology. And lots more spin off from Seattle Folklore Society. There was a wonderful folklore star on the, uh, the university started by Thane Mitchell and later became an independent business. Phil and Bill and Williams started the Northwest Folklife Festival at Seattle Center. Williams told us about the start of the event in an article to Jennifer White. Among the decent sized first year crowd was Leo Barnish. He was of the National Festival Association from Washington, D.C. He asked Phil in 72, how did you ever audition all these 300 performers and groups? We didn't audition any of them. <laughs> and I love this line. If you give a person an opportunity, they will do a good job. We tried to stay away from stars. No one was featured. Folk life is about what people do. Folk life was a chance to present a broad spectrum of things people could actually do themselves. This legacy continues now in the hands of an independent organization. But I know all the performers I was involved with down south in Tacoma, they were all tracing up and playing at Folk Life, doing open mics up there. They were presenting, they were doing sea songs, they were at the dances, everywhere. So it was a huge movement of, of all the performers in the area. And really, that is part of the legacy of Seattle Folklore Society, how many people they affect and move. Going back to that parallel universe, universe many musicians that were in Northern California migrated up here. People like Jim Page, Eric Eshelman, Dave Lipman, Ed Lowe. And across the bay, people we just kind of knew, the Gypsy Gentle String Band and Sandy Bradley. They showed up at a courtesy open mic, we got a couple of jobs for them, and they kind of disappeared. What they were doing was getting in the same areas with Phil and Vivian Williams, and the whole contraband, the contra dance and square dance and other kinds of dance scene began to develop. It became one of the largest in the entire country. It's an amazing feat. We're going to, um, the, the, some of the things that they, uh, that did, they happened is that if you could go to a dance in 1985, um, you could go dance every night between Bellingham and Olympia. That's how strong that particular community became, just because they supplied the impetus for people like Victory Music and others to do it. There are all sorts of spin-offs that continue all over Northwest from Bellingham to Olympia. If this, like, like the Seattle Folklore Society, you create the conditions for folks to participate or present music, they will. 
both Seattle Folklore Society and Victory Music and various reincarnations we've all had have gone through tough times financially and just having enough bodies to do the job. There is a great saga of the breakup and spin-off of folk life in the Seattle Folklore Society, known by insiders as the Great Computer Robbery. That is an hour-long story, and I have only a few here. The organizations went through separate ways, but Seattle Folklore Society had to find a way to fill the financial void here. This might have sunk them if it weren't for a philanthropist named Ed Littlefield with a $50,000 grant from Seattle Folklore Society. To the Folklore Society. Yeah. Pretty amazing. He did a lot of other things, too. Again, in the parallel universe, Ed Littlefield and Jim Page, teenagers jamming in Palo Alto, California. <laughs> and here we are in that parallel universe for a couple more contemporary shots today. In the current October 2016 issue, you see the concept of Seattle Folklore so present, presented with Jeff Warner. Jeff and I did a whole bunch of things with the International Folk Alliance, serving on board committees and doing all kinds of things. And the next month, you're going to be presenting Heidi Miller, who served on our board, and Jim Page, who's been playing with us since he was a teenager in Palo Alto. Today, Seattle Folklore Society continues to present concerts, both national, world acts, and top regional acts. They have a monthly 16-page flyer with articles and an 80-event calendar, information on every diverse concert series, a monthly contra dance, song circles, sporting attire, folk and Americana community. They supply resources for dance, archival information, <coughs> classes, workshops you can get involved in. They've been doing this for 50 years, and it's touched so many people, there is no way you could you know, count it. For any organization to survive the trends, all the politics, the financials up and down, for a half century is simply amazing. You cannot count all those hundreds and thousands of hours or individuals that have made Seattle Folklore Society happen. But I'm sure the first 20 who chipped in $20 each to make it happen, John and Sally Ashford, Arnie and Judy Benedict, Chuck Burris, Davey Coffin, John Kuhn, John Gallant, Charles Laird, Kitty Leaf, Rich Levine, Jack Levy, Barney Munger, the Nam Hunt, Erwin Nash, John Allman, John Watt, Barb and I, Eric Eisman, Phil and Vivian Williams, and David Whitehorn. They made it happen. I'm sure they would say, here's the torch. Run with it on the second 50 years. Thanks, Seattle Folklore Society, for leading the way to a better community for all of us and for myself and everybody I ever heard saw. Thank you. Uh, as we uh, host and uh, produce concerts, 
Um, we have an aging audience. The audience are getting gray or losing hair like many of us. So it is a particular treat to note how many young performers we have here. And I've had heard so much about the Wintergrass Academy and the work that, that Joe Stephen and Hunter are doing to encourage young folks. I like to point out, as I did back ago when we celebrated our 40th uh, uh, anniversary, that uh, we're still here and the Seattle Supersonics are gone. <laughs> <laughs> we're still here in Parker's Ballroom uh, up in North Seattle and Lake Hills Ballroom here on the east side and the Eagles Auditorium where they had all those dances are gone. And uh, politicians do uh, um, serve their terms and leave. The Seattle Folklore Society is here and is going to continue. And to that, I want to particularly make note of uh, out of the far end, Wes Waddell at the, at the uh, venue's choice concert, he pointed out he was the young member of the uh, <laughs> audience back in about 15 years ago or longer when we used to he used to serve coffee and uh, bakery items at the Grateful Bed Bakery where we used to uh, host concerts and squeeze about 70 people if we were lucky to be there. We did have an opportunity to hear Dave Carter in his early years by himself uh, at one of those concerts. We have Marnie uh, Raphael and uh, Gene Geiger and Craig Lund, who were active participants, active producers in our uh, of our concerts. We all share that volunteer responsibility. Uh, we couldn't get along without uh, volunteers extraordinaire like uh, John Hibbs here at this end. John is uh, we haven't yet encouraged him enough to produce a concert, but John is one of those volunteers who takes that extra step and helps us do a better job of producing concerts. And uh, we have uh, Susan Powell and myself who have been, uh, we were the co-chairs of the committee for frankly just long enough. <laughs> that we've now retired. And Valerie Cohen is one of the uh, volunteer, uh, or she's uh, the uh, co-producer or co-director now of the year, of the chair of the uh, committee. And without Nels, Nels is Susan's husband, and he's the fajita maker at the after concert parties. He's the one who stays away from the concert committee meetings, which uh, I bet is a pleasure to both him and Susan, uh, so he doesn't have to listen to us when we have our monthly meetings. And uh, well, he's also done sound for us, like so many. We rely on about 10 to 12 volunteer producers, another two dozen volunteer um, concert helpers every week. Uh, Chris has mentioned Jim Page coming to town next, uh, or actually he's in town, but we're going to host a concert uh, for him next um, month, and uh, if you're going to stick around town tomorrow night, Jamie LaValle is going to be in concert at the, over at the Finney Neighborhood Center, so, uh, oh, and Richard Gilman, he's right behind us, emeritus committee member, and, uh, and boy, the one who really helped us turn into the modern age with the computers uh, back when we got our website going and so forth and so on. Thank you so much for honoring us. We will honor you back and be back next year and 10 years down the road to tell you that we're celebrating our 60th anniversary, I am sure.